Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Class Stand Podcast. Our special guest today is Neville Southall. Neville, thanks for coming to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your definition of a world class player? Um, somebody with a good football brain. Not necessarily a good human brain, <laughs> but a good football brain. Somebody who can see things really quick. Um, somebody who's really instinctive. It's, it's inbred in them. And I think there's some things you can teach people, but some things you can't. And it's that, that one little bit that nobody can teach you. Uh, and some players have it and some players don't. Some players have the charisma to go with it and some don't. Yeah. But mainly, it's, it's they produce 99.9 times out of 100. And that's what makes them world class over a period of time, not just over a season. That was yeah. going to be my follow-up question. Um, is there a specific time period of like how long they need to perform for? Is like a minimum? It's like three years, well, yeah, five I mean, years? Yeah, I mean, if you look now... Um, you've got Holland at Man City, but yeah. okay. Could he do it for five or six years at least? You look at, is it Luke Littler or whatever his name is, the darts yeah, player? Yeah, yeah. Burst on the scenes. Once he's, once it settles, is he going to keep on producing, producing, producing? And that, that's the hard bit. It's not, it's not bursting on the scene and doing well for a, a period of time. It's consistency over a period of time. You know, I've never known any famous painters paint one painting and just bug it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you you have to yeah. you have to learn your craft. Yeah. You know, yeah. over a period of time, and it's harder now than ever before because everybody wants to stop you doing stuff. Yeah. So the, the clubs want to stop you. So what I think most players now, once they play ten years or five years of behind in their education, because they only play half the games they should play. Yeah. So therefore, how do you how do you get better? You get better over a period of time by a sports person sp- supposed to push themselves beyond what they think they're capable of. But you're not allowed to anymore. Yeah. Because fitness people won't have it. The psychologists won't have it. The clubs will, won't have it. So if you're playing only half the games that you should play, then you're only getting half your education per season. So it's going to take you twice as long to get to the level where you want to get it. That's where your natural talent comes in, if you find one. Yeah, you're talking a bit about squad rotation as well now. Squads are bigger these days. Squad rotation's a waste of time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. To the average person in the street, it's complete bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> they want to see the best players play, right? I would say. You want your best team, but to the average person in the street that goes to work every single day, five days a week from seven till whatever time they go to work, or eight till five, they don't do four days a month. True. So well, nobody can understand why they can't do that. So, like I say, everything's geared to stopping them doing stuff. Uh, and my thing is, is if the SES only train for 10 minutes a day and then go in, that's fine. But they never do that. But they want to be the elite. So anything, if you want to be elite, you have to work at it. But you can't anymore because they've all got the bloody computers. Oh, you're on the red zone, you're on the yellow zone. Do you know what I'm so it's like a game now, isn't it? Oh, you're... You're on this, you can only play 17 minutes. Oh, come on. Yeah. How the hell did people climb a mountain? How the hell did people sail an ocean? Because of them, they go, oh, you've gone to Portsmouth, that's enough for now today, mate. <laughs> You're in Southampton, that's far enough. So yeah. it's about pushing boundaries, and it, to be a sports person? How do you get better? Yeah. And you can see all the other sports are trained longer and harder. I've got better players. Well, I'd be interested in comparison between the darts players, the snooker players, and football players, who, who uh, actually trains longer. Yeah, yeah. A, practice makes perfect, as they say. A lot, lot, lot of hours on the practice table. Practice How do you get board. better? Yeah, you don't get better just by just doing it. Uh, one day, like for two hours a, a week, you, you don't get. You have to play a number of games for the situations to arise as well. It seems that like we're trying to create robotic humans to exactly what the the coach does on his iPad. Yeah. But football's about people. And people are all mixed up. Yeah. Yeah, I think football's lost its flair compared to the yeah. old days. They're stuck in a it's system. It's lost its relationship with people. So you've got to remember, right, and you can say VAR, right, it's, it's a killer for refs. A ref's human, yes or no? Do they, do they honestly try and make mistakes? No. Are they honest? Yeah, I think they are. So why are we having all this? Who's who's VAR for? VAR's not for the normal punter that pays his money. Yeah. VAR's for the bigger clubs that go, oh, we might lose against them by a fluke. Get out of that. So we need to sort all that out. There's no shocks. 
don't need any shocks. The drama, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, we don't need any of that. So it's taken, it's got colder and more clinical as, as things have gone. And where you had characters before, because they were allowed to be themselves, you can't have them anymore. Because the media won't have it and the clubs won't have it. You ever so, sit with somebody from a club now? Yeah. A media person sits next to them, frightened to death what you can ask them. <laughs> they are, they'll shit themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, got yeah. a point. Yeah. And that, but why? Surely people should be able to just talk normally. Yeah. Because the, you've got to reflect what's in the stand. And they don't. They don't reflect it. They're, they're just, it's a different place, a different animal now to what it was. Whereas in the old days, the, the club had the power. Uh, the chairman had the power on the board and then the players were underneath that, socially standing as well. Then you had the, you had the normal punters who come and threw the rats in the air and rattled the rattles. And then it started to change, and now the players have got so much power. But what could you do to them? How would you hurt somebody? Um, oh, you, you've got to do extra training. Oh, our fitness fella said he can't do that. Oh, I've got a headache. Oh, I've got... I don't mind. There's so many excuses now. It's just... They don't perform. So if you're talking about world class, yeah, you're seeing a flat line in a football for me. If you can name me five world class players in the Premier League, you do well. Okay. We leave that yeah. to you later. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you know, uh, you so so the so the thing is right is that w- once you get an average, once you get to a point where your players have reached their peaks, which a lot of them have in the Premier League, and uh, there, everything below it is not very good. So if Man City and Chelsea buy them, what's left for everybody else? So the, the trick is not buying people; it's it's getting rid of them because. People have got no patience, so they sack all the managers. So that fella goes into the academy, he wants to do it his way, so he gets the academy and goes, we're going to do that. Right, the next fella comes in, he goes, oh, that's shit, we're going to do this. So now you've got two lots of dead wood, because the third manager has come in, doesn't like any of them. So clubs have got to get back to having their own philosophy and, and going academy separate. Pick a manager to fit in with our philosophy. But they don't, because they all panic. Yeah, yeah. We were speaking to um, Kerry Bowley, um, who was at um, Manchester City doing the City Football Group, mm. and also um, assistant managers at Rangers. And he was talking about having that um, succinct philosophy from the academy and the first team. So identifying um, the players and how they're going to fit into the system once they graduate from um, the youth team, which football. is fine if you stay in charge. Yes, yeah. that, that, I suppose that's so. The, the club has to do three. The club has to be. So this is what an Everton player is. And this is how we produce an Everton player. This is what we want. Okay, every manager's got to come in and play that way and, and have that philosophy because we're not having anybody coming in and totally changing what we've got because this is a philosophy we believe in. This is what an Everton player is. This is what we're buying. You look at the recruitment of Everton. We bought somebody who was six foot five. So no, after we bought like a, a three foot two winger. No one here had anything. Yeah. And then you go, oh, okay, so what type of player is an Everton player? So we used to be able to say, West Ham player. Yeah. Great on the ball, blah, blah, blah. Always, they always try to play football. Had a little bit of steel in there, but not, not that much. You could get at them, but they'd let you play football. Then you go to Wimbledon, and Wimbledon would just be, okay, 45 set pieces, we score a goal, we'll intimidate you, we'll do whatever we want. So they have their identity. Now, I think people are fucking stupid in football. Right? <laughs> well, they are the f- Why would you, as Sheffield United... Or something like that. Go to Man City and play them the way Man City want to play. Exactly what happened against Arsenal, yeah. I think, the other night. They tried to play out from the yeah, back. Yeah, but you see, what they've got to do is please the football gods. Mm. And the football gods normally are Sky. Right? And I think it started with Arsene Wenger. Because when Arsene Wenger came in and he looked at Wimbledon and he looked at them teams, Burnley and things, he went, oh, fucking not having this. We're not having them kicking our players. This isn't a way to play football. Yeah. Right? So now there's a football god that sits in the Sky Studios. You can't play like that. Yeah. You can't, you've got to have 15 passes, 20 passes. And then you've got people. They go, well, if you score, th- if you do three passes and score, what's the problem with that? Oh, no, you, that's not the way you play. That's not the way you play. So you go, huh. it's fucking. Sports about getting results. Yeah. Mm. You know, I do you, agree with that. I think uh, the lower teams do try to play like the top teams, and it doesn't <laughs> work. And most of the time, it does make for a boring game if you've got two lower clubs. Trying to do what the top six do in every European uh, league. Well, see, it's the difference between the top and the bottom, right, is the brains. Right, when I played at Torquay, for instance, right, I'd shout keepers and they boot it away. <laughs> shout away and they let it go. So because they concentrate on the ball a lot of the times, it's like focus there. 
other people can read the situation, it's easier. The higher up you go, it's much easier to play. The lower down you go, the less the, the unpredictable because you ain't got a clue. So, in the old days, you go, I'll tell you what, centre and a half, you fucking edit and kick it. Right back, as soon as you get it, fucking launch it in the channel. You do that, you do that. And, and everyone was happy. And they pressurised the ball and it was really physical. Now, it's pass, pass, pass. And they're going, right, okay, why are we passing? We don't know why we're passing. Mm. But we're passing because he says we've got to pass. So when do you go forward? And the biggest thing that nobody's mentioned on Sky is it if I'm a goalie, right, and I come rushing out the box, right, with the ball, and I launch it over the top of four Premier League players and somebody runs in and scores. I say schoolboy football. Yeah. And it happens time and time again and everyone goes, oh, fucking hell, what a great pass. You know, how fucking thick have you got to be? If he's got time on a ball, you just drop to the edge of your box. He's got nowhere to go. He's going to launch it. I'm going to edit it away. But they're going, oh, fucking hell, it's gone over the top. We were surprised on that. How were they surprised? So for me, it, football's changed because they just go, oh, shit, one ball beats everybody. How was that football? Mm. Creative because, disease, maybe because, not right, the game. when they do that, it's a great pass. When they have 15,000 passes and score, great. If a fullback gets it and launches it, they go, it's a fucking long ball. But they expect the goalies to lash it. Oh, well, and the, and the, the stuff with the goalies with the ball at the feet is complete. That's a con. Yeah. It's an absolute con. Ball comes back to you right in my day. If you're lucky enough to pick it up without getting shoulder charges or or some stuck in studs in your head, right, you pick it up. The fullbacks might go wide, depending on how you're doing as a team. If you're doing badly... We stand next to him and I go, fucking don't throw it here. <laughs> right, centre halves go, fuck off, we're not having it. Kick it. Yeah. So you end up just kicking it. These days, ball comes back, everyone drops so deep and so easy. Like, all you've got to do is pass from here to your camera. And if they do get challenged, they just fucking launch it anyways. So how is that? Why have we got to be good on the ball? Because fucking hell, we can all pass to there now. Yeah. There's a lot so, of uh, short passing in the game, like you said, trying to pass it from the back. Well, you've, got to, you've got to play the game that's in front of you. I don't think that's what sides... But teams give you yeah, the opportunity lacking. for the goalie to chip it out to the touchline. Because they know you're not going to fucking score from there. Yeah. They're quite happy for you to chip it to the touchline. Go on, then. chip it there. we will close you down a bit, you go back. And you go, oh, chip it the other side. Oh, they'll go and close him and they'll push you back and they push you back and they go that. And they get fucking nowhere. And they're frightened to death to go forward half the time. Because the, uh, there's no presence up the top, is there? No, yeah. they uh, a big man at the top is not uh, something that you know teams go for these days. Is a different style, isn't it? In their final third, tick what, attacker. What do Man City do? Man City don't drop off. Liverpool don't drop off. But that's a new thing. High press. It's not a new thing. Everybody was doing it. It's not, yeah. but, uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere, because Sky came in, football's changed into this wondrous thing that nobody else has ever done before. Well, it's fucking bonkers, man. <laughs> sit there. Well, I'll tell you how bad it gets is when everybody talks about the pundits on a Monday and nothing about the game. Yeah, we've got a bit on that, actually, yeah. to ask. The yeah, pundits yeah. are good because I'm sure I could sit there before a the game and go, I think this might happen. And at half-time say, well, that should have happened and that might happen second half. And at the end of the game, say, I fucking told you all that should have happened. <laughs> so, yeah, and you have yeah. to have four or five of them to tell you. Um, so, <clears throat> I was going to say, um, talking about world-class players, um, there's some really good goalkeepers in the, or, well, in my opinion, I don't know, maybe your opinion. Uh, what, what do you think of, like, Edison, Alisson? Uh, okay. You, you, would you say they're world-class, or? In today's, in today's world, probably, in the scheme of go where goalkeepers are, they're well here. Right, okay. Because of the way they think. Because they all think a different way now. They're quite happy just to get a touch on the ball. Yeah. And that's it. Doesn't matter where it goes, what happens after that, as long as you save it. And they go, don't. You're thinking, no. Nah. They, 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 their thinking's wrong because they only want to do enough. If you were world class, right, wouldn't you be one of the first ones to catch all the balls? You're coming out and dominating the. the well, no, just catch your fucking shots. Yeah. yeah. Just catch, catch your shot when it comes in. Now, does it? And they go, oh, fuck, here you go. And they score a rebound, they go, oh, I fucking hell, I saved it though, don't I? Yeah. And they go, oh, yeah, the ball moves. Fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so they, that's the other thing, right? They all say the ball moves. In the old days, we had a mitre ball that did something if you hit it on the, on the valve. The umbrella ball, that might be okay, might not. 
but I, I did Adora ball, we had a Puma ball, we had a, we had a Nike ball, and they all did different things. And you know, like a tang, I did a Stango at Liverpool. So when you when you do that, when you're going to play somebody, you just get you just used to get ten balls as a goalkeeper, and you go right, okay, let's work out what they do, and then go from there. It was never a surprise on a Saturday mm-hmm. when it suddenly moved. These go, fuck, it's moved. But yeah, move Monday to Friday, mate. What's the problem? <laughs> yeah. So, you, so what I'm saying is, yeah. If you've done the old work in the week, you've no way to push the ball. Yeah. So you're practicing that, yeah. but they're going, oh, God, I've just got a touch. And it's it's their thinking, it's it's their it's their ambition and their thinking. What what's like is is the thing that I hate, is because they're quite happy just to get touch on a ball. Do you want to be better than that? Mm. Do you want to be the best, 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 or do you want to just make the save? And you go, oh yeah, I saved it. And then they go, fuck, you know, what, what's supposed to do with that? Well, we'll catch it in the fucking first place. <laughs> yeah. Well, because you push it from here, right? Like that. I'm thinking, it's fair. Get your body behind the ball and catch, catch it. it. Yeah. Catch it. You don't have a problem. But they seem to have that real, I don't know, it seems to become football, the goalkeeper especially, seems to become more theatre. Do you think it's diving mm. for the cameras, maybe? Well, no fucker dives anymore, do they, are they? There's 20 mm. players that dive, and the other two don't fucking bother. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, and that's, you look at it, and you go, on, oh, come on. Come on. You know, and I know, right? I look at it, and the, the goalie stands on the line, and somebody stands in front of me, and he goes, oh, fuck, you know, ref, ref, anything. Why are you doing that? How stupid have you got to be to do that? And they think it's just going to work. Like, if they stood out a little bit, they've got two ways to go. You stand on the line, you've got only got one way to go. Right? And if yeah. you're clever, right, you walk up to the fellow who's in front of you and you put your arm through his arm and you hold it in tight and you go, fucking hell, Robbie. And he's trying to pull because he wants to get away. So the ref's seen him pull. Yeah. Quick free yeah. kick in for the keeper. Yeah. Mm. So, the no brains. You never see a, a six foot four goalie makes himself four foot six. Why? He's just saying to that fella, Fucking if you put it down there, I'm struggling. Slide it, yeah. So he goes, okay. Dink, right over him. If you stood up where you were, and then you train properly, doing that, because that's your problem. Yeah. You should be confident enough to do that, confident enough to stand up and go, fucking beat me. But they don't do that. They go, oh, look, I'm really fucking worried about this. And all that stuff when they go like that. They come out like that, and they turn their body. Now, how can you see the ball? You can't. So you lose sight of the ball. So the little things just make a massive difference. And I don't know who keeps teaching them. Because it's, it's common sense. Can I see the ball? No, well, I'm never going to fucking save it then, am I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm never going to save it. So yeah. the, the idea is you face the ball because that's your biggest target. That's your biggest barrier. Yeah. Not that. You think it'll be uh, a bit braver, bit braver coming out, taking but, the ball in the face. Yeah, but they don't even, they don't even try and con, you know, if you, if you know what, no forwards, right? Some really good ones and there's really thick ones, right? The thick ones are all right because you can always con them. And you know, there's some that will just use power and some will, you know, try and catch it out. But if in general, if it comes through, you know he wants you to move. So if you're clever, you can trap him. And you move to the left, knowing that you're going to go to right. He goes to the right, you go, well, thanks very fucking much. Mm. But they don't think. There's none of that shit. Bit robotic, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's a game of like, Catch it, you know, chess, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. But they don't, they don't do any of that. They go, oh fuck, he's good. So the the thinking has changed. But and again, I keep going back to the same thing. You sit down and go, right, let's have a look at what how you did that, how you did that, how you did that. Are you are you thinking about the build up play? Do you know where the other players are? And most of them are like, fuck, there's a ball. It's just like a shock. Mm. The better ones. Like Alison and others, they, 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 they're quite calm, they, they're, they're okay. Do you know what I mean? Some of the others get so wound up, and you think, but you just fucking calm down. Calm down, because everybody else around you will calm down. Just chill out, and we'll be all right. Don't fucking start jumping around, shouting at everybody, because it don't work. Yeah. Not now, because the players have got no resilience. Yeah. You shout at them, they go, oh, fuck, you shouting at me. Yeah, the, the um since obviously you were playing the, the the price of goalkeepers have gone through the roof as well, yeah. paying uh, loads of money. Um, yeah, but to be fair, my petrol's gone up as well. So, <laughs> so That's everything true. goes up on market, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think it will develop eventually when the Super League comes to like the American. You think that's a, that's a cert, do you Super League? 
European Super League. Oh, won't it? They've tried it. Yeah. yeah. It's like every government. We'll drop it in there. Yeah. Everyone goes, oh, fuck, we're not having that. Tiptoe. Oh, we'll drop it in again then. Mm. Yeah. I think it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. I think it will come around. It's got, but they've got to, they know they've got to have promotion and relegation. Because you, Newcastle won't get in there. Unless they've improved dramatically. But they'll have a stadium. They'll have financial uh, clout to be able to get there. So you're not going to tell me they're going to not let them in. Yeah. And then yeah. you've got with the Super League, are they going to let people play international football? You could be seeing the last few years of international football. You think that could be coming to an end? Well, if, I, if I'm playing for Man United in the Super League and Man United have they've got their own organisation, one we have to either pay their wages and insure them for ridiculous amounts of money mm-hmm. or they don't come. What, what hold have we got on them? Yeah, I suppose uh, if they're so, their own separate then, entity. They... Yeah, you're going to have to pay for them, aren't you? Mm. Somehow. Or they, don't, they just go, I'll tell you what, no, we're not going. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Unless you give us... So it's, Football's got a big change coming, yeah. and the way you watch football's got a big change, because most of it will just be, if you want to watch Everton or Liverpool or whatever, you'll just be, you'll just have to buy their stream, or whoever mm-hmm. they go with, and the bigger the clubs, they'll have a better streams, won't they? They'll go with Amazon and people like that. The other ones will go. I tell you what, we've got Everton TV and whatever, and then, you know, people will buy into that. But but the the people in the Super League will. Again, they they want to keep all the money. Mm. You know, you're not going to tell me that half of them clubs give a fuck about fucking Berry and Colchester, and they don't give a shit about them. They're just looking after themselves because, yeah, most businesses do. Yeah, and yet we think it's immoral. Mm-hmm. Is it immoral for you to run a business and not give a fuck about your competitors? I think so. I think it, without the football league, um, you're not going to have a thriving Premier League. That that's where a lot of the players come through. And then to have only, um, I think it's 10% of the TV money from the Sky deals goes back into the Football League, your grassroots football. Do you um, think they're really interested in that? I don't think they're interested, no. no. But they should, if you was a moral person, uh, you should be well, able to give back. Name, name, me, name me somebody in football who is. Well, yeah. That, because they don't whole. even pay their 5%. Mm. They haven't paid their 5% for ages, so. Well, not. See, I would rather go the other way and say, tell you what, spend whatever you want to spend. And if you go out of business, you don't fuck a fault. Yeah, just uh, take that. That's what happens on the I Street. Capitalism. If you, if you yeah, we've well, badly run. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. You know, Evan and Man City. How, how do they compete? But if they fuck it up, they fuck it up, don't they? Mm. So maybe that would stop them going. Tell you what, you can't compete with Man City at the moment because mm. the money's not a million miles away. So get what you're going to get, mm. but don't try and compete with them. And and where's the due diligence in football anymore? How have we got owners that I like what they are? Do you think, just on that point, the whole independent regulator thing is going to come come around as well? There seems to be a bit of chat about it. What power have they got? So here yeah. you go. We've got, we've got a fucking billionaire here from Russia who wants to take over a club. Club are in desperate need and may go under. And they go, no, he's not a good owner. Mm-hmm. Well, so you let the club go to the wall. No. Okay, <laughs> he's okay. They proved it with mm-hmm. teams that they've already let people own. That it's not moral. So there's no due. They do due diligence, but do they really know where all the money comes from? Yeah, yeah. I suppose, especially with well, Newcastle and you know uh, the, the Saudi well, Arabia. How many British Virginia. owners are there? Uh, I, was not, uh, I think only the, the guy coming from um, in Manchester United and he kind of only 25% owns the club. So he owns 25%. Exactly, yeah. The uh, rest of America and all. Ineos, yeah. Ineos will come in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Mike Ashley, last time, that's when I remember, Newcastle. Yeah. Um, not many. Yeah, not many <laughs> not at many, all. Though. Not many. So all your money's going to come from outside here of, of Britain. So it's very hard to keep track of that, isn't it? Yeah. Is it yeah, going to stay exactly, in Britain yeah. as well? So how would you do it? You know, yeah. you, you look at Everton now, Everton should have a line of people waiting to take over the club. We've got one. Mm-hmm. Now what are they seeing that we're not seeing? Yeah, um, we, the new stadium's obviously coming around the corner, isn't well, it? They don't so own the new stadium, do they? Yeah. So, you know, and at the end of the day, everybody in that club 
every fan would go, 500 million, spend it on the players. So let's be successful, then move into a new ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's not be shit and move into a new ground because you've got to fill it corporately. You, you're not going to move into a stadium like that and try and get it full without being successful. That's what Arsenal did, kind of, didn't they? When they moved from Highbury to the Emirates, yeah. they were successful, yeah. moved over, obviously then... One of the very few clubs who've done it. Yeah. You know, you've got Bolton and people like that, they got fucking relegated. Mm-hmm. No, West Ham they struggled with the new ground at first as well. So when you talk, it was when you go to when you went to Upton Park, it was enclosed, the atmosphere was there, it was brilliant. Then you go to a bigger ground, it's go wide. You, think you lose something, you lose you lose the groups of people who've been sat there for forty years, thirty to twenty, thirty years. Yeah. And you go, Oh, we're not sat by them anymore. So the whole dynamic of the ground changes because you could be sat by somebody who's bought a season ticket and he lives in fucking Norway. Yeah. And he comes over like for a couple of games a season. I just think, so the dynamic of the grounds change when you have a new ground. United will find it. Yeah. United will, United will definitely find it. Since since the way they've grown, their Stratford End is not their Stratford End anymore, is it? Yeah. It's changed, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah ever, but the, the dynamic of the crowds change. Yeah, the atmosphere is not as good as it used to be. Uh, even back watching football, when I go back into it in the 90s, you could say it was much more, you know, more of an atmosphere. Uh, especially Highbury, um, but it was Upton a, Park. Yeah, Park. Yeah. It was a d- different game, mm. and it was physical. Yeah, and it was. They, they keep telling me that this is faster and more physical, which I doubt. To be fair, it might be faster on a changeover, but not consistently faster. Because it, nobody went. And I can't remember us ever going anywhere to draw a game. Mm-hmm. Ever. No. Yeah. Oh, they try and win. Yeah. Now nah, it's go somewhere and, and don't lose first. Don't lose first and see what happens. And then you go, okay, fucking boring as fuck, isn't it? <laughs> but it is, and that's why. But that's why I, I think one of the reasons why a little bit of violence and, and, and racism and all that sort of shit is coming back in is because there's nothing on the pitch. Boredom, right? Where you know, in rugby, you go along and there's, there's always a fight and there's always, there's always physicality and everyone's like, "Ooh, fucking great!" This and blah, blah, blah. so different clientele, and then. It's starting to come in, in in that. The women's game, I think, will find it eventually. The more money they put into women's league, I think the worse the other stuff around it will get because they're open to more money, so they'll go different places, they'll be higher profile. You'll start going, do, do, and you'll start, and they have started already, just nailing people. Because, you know, but as soon as you get on that telly, people either like you or they fucking eat you. Uh, build you up to knock you down sort of thing yeah, with the press is. but the, the women aren't used to it at the moment mm. not because the game's been really good they don't dive that much but that also, that'll increase because it's increased in rugby yeah. people now dive more to the ref more than they've ever done in rugby because there's more of that and there's, there's more pressure on people mm. so, and, and you look darts do the same thing darts will have a, a moan up and stuff like that and you'll see it in women's football eventually but the atmosphere might change around the ground because if you think back to the cricket, the cricket was all nice, and then all of a sudden they thought, "Fuck, how are we going to do this?" So they have a different kind of game. They come in, everyone gets pissed. A really short space of time. It's a bit louder. So yeah, it's just, it just becomes uh, all more marketable, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, every, the higher your profile, yeah. the more idiots you attract. Yeah. And we don't do anything at the top to stamp it out. You're, you're telling me that. The World Cup in Qatar and the World Cup in Russia was was good for everybody's morals. No. But we still went. And we'll go again. <laughs> and we'll do something else. And, that's, and you're not telling me that if you go into one of the Eastern Bloc countries where the racism is absolutely horrendous and they go, I'll find you 10 grand. Well, they say, tell you what, as soon as a bit of racism, you're out of the competition. Yeah. See you later. We're not having it. Until you get your grassroots sorted out, so that this doesn't happen at the top. See you later. If you were playing for Wales at the time when they went to the Qatar uh, World Club, I wouldn't have gone. You wouldn't have gone. No, I wouldn't go this time. Somebody asked me to go. I wouldn't go. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone to Russia. Even Russia as well. Yeah, the LGBT stuff is fucking disgraceful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what they do is disgraceful. Yeah, but we went. See, was I? If it was me, I'd have took an LGBT team there. I said, yeah. oh, I can play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so well, there was still that for around the, um, the captain's armbands, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't do that in Qatar. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I, I know that people who went out there from organisations were followed round by people. Really? Security people. Yeah, they were followed round to see what they were doing. So, uh, you know, I'm sure when I spoke to somebody, the LGBT fans clubs, it took them nine hotels before they could have two men share a bedroom. So, I mean, so uh, it's, it's totally different. They're a different situation. They can buy whatever they want to buy. They didn't have to have a World Cup. They can yeah. just buy in what they want to buy, and there's always somebody. And I know, you know, what's your morals worth? Yeah. What's your morals worth? Yeah. 10 million? A million? Two million? People go, oh, you yeah, shouldn't be going, like Saudi now, shouldn't be going out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jordan Henson come under a lot of criticism, didn't he? Because uh, he was a. He did, but. Had Saudi all them people go, oh, fucking hell. How many of them would turn down the money? That's the that's that's the thing, isn't it? Just, uh, yeah. yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, what normally happens in them kind of places is they're used to playing in front of big crowds on big occasions and they go somewhere there and there's fucking 300 people. That kills it for them. Yeah. Not the money and all that. Yeah. Yeah, so... It's funny because Matt Letizia said the same thing on our... Yeah. Uh, we've interviewed him as well and he said exactly the same thing. The crowd is what you... Well, you'd hope most footballers play football for yeah. is that reaction when you... you play do. football because you want to play football and do the best in the, in the best in the best arenas in, in the biggest games. Yeah. And then you go to Saudi and like there's fucking nobody there and what do you get out of it? Yeah. Mm. You don't get anything out of it. Apart from it, you go, I'll tell you what, oh, I can buy another fucking jet tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So if you go in there for that reason, and then you go and get your head straight and go, I'm here for the money. I'll help these as much as I can. I'll do my best. But I'm here for the money, and that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But don't pretend shit because nobody's going to buy into that. Oh, I'm coming here to change football. Yeah. How good is China? How good is China now? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And how much did they throw at it? Japan and Galileo went there. Are they, are they a million times? Can you name 10? Japanese t- players? Nope. Nope. Not. Oh, no. Nothing's up in the head. <laughs> Ten Chinese players? Nope. So their the league. Americans, can you do Americans? Bit better. A bit better, but <laughs> they, yeah. they, they started with Pelly and Beckenbauer. And, you know, when they first started, I remember Vlad was telling me that when one of their managers was doing badly, they brought him on the fucking, on the pitch in a coffin. <laughs> and then he brought somebody on that, uh, with an elephant. Well. Stuff like that. So they had all the razzmatazz around it before it settled down and then, but their, their academies are, are better than they've ever been. But they've taken a long, long time. Yeah. And they've competed with American football. And it's really difficult for them. But again, if you go back to your viewing figures and stuff like that, you look at the American football now, where are they going? Coming to Britain? Cause, Global, yeah. Well, where's their audience? They can only sell so many subscriptions. Mm-hmm. So they go there. They went to Brazil last time, didn't they? So they, and you think the Super League would do that? The Super League will play around the world, not just. I think that's what a lot of the driver is, isn't it? Is to, yes. I mean, the Premier League is global anyway, but introducing all the other big clubs in Europe yeah. as well, that product becomes yeah. even better. Everybody wants to sell tickets and shirts. They're yeah, looking yeah. for different ways to sell stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're not well, looking like at people, are they? They're looking at. I tell you what, the fans. Yeah. What can we sell these nuggets? Yeah, yeah. the Super League will. I think, like geographically, Europe is probably the size of America. They're thinking we can get the NFL franchise turn into a Super League in Europe and I'll be there. I think I'll leave. The Welsh clubs will be struggling. The Irish clubs will struggle. The Scottish clubs will struggle. Because yeah. Yeah. maybe Celtic Rangers, because they, they can move grounds probably and fill the grounds. They might have a chance. But not if they're going to get beat 6 0 every week. Mm hmm. So it's going to depend on all the good players will go that way, won't they? Yeah. It'll be a fairer for everybody else because we'll just have what's left. When you think about it, that's all that happens anyway. You know, yeah, Everton true. can't go to Marks and Spencers anymore to buy a player, can they? <laughs> you can't. They've got to go to fucking Aldi's and stuff like that, which are, which are decent players, but not up to the standard of the top. Yeah, the top six. Yeah, and, and all the big clubs buy the best players. Yeah. And that's yeah. just the way it is. And they'll buy them so no fucking else can have them. Yeah, yeah. The Chelsea did that a lot, stockpiling youth players, just pinching them from other people's yeah, academies. It's very, it's very difficult to do that, to be fair, because you're taking a chance on how good they are, and then you end up with a certain type of player, like all runners, and no one to pass to them. 
Mm. So, yeah. It's mad. So, uh, football's had massive changes. So, we've talked about a lot of stuff there, which is great, and we'll um, dive into it a bit more. But one of the parts of uh, what we wanted to hear from you is um, is your 1 to 11 and manager that you've played with or against, up to you. So, I mean, I'm easy because I'd pick out with Kendall and our team that won the um, Cup was coming up in uh, 85. Yeah. Do you know why? Because I trust him, I trust all them. Brilliant. Yeah. And that's it. I trust them all. I trust them all today with anything. Any yeah. of those players world class for you on the pitch? I think that the, the one that never gets the the, the acclaim is Kevin Sheedy. We could replace everybody in the team apart from him. Yeah. There's nobody on the left foot like him. We could replace everybody else. We had Kevin, Kevin Richard and Alan Harper who could play in every position really. We could we had Bobby Mims for me, they had the centre arms, we had midfield players, we had strikers. We couldn't nobody could do what he did. So is he getting the stamp? Is he getting the world class stamp? I thought he was world class, yeah, because he could do things that nobody else could do. And if you looked at him, if he was a horse, you'd have probably put him down. Do you know what I mean? When he first got, <laughs> you look at him, you go, no, <laughs> not I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not sure. You know, when he first came, I thought, fucking hell, he's got stones in his shoe or something. Oh, he's fucking hobbling round, and, and all of a sudden he starts fucking pinging balls, and he's just going, Fair enough. classy. Do you know what I mean? And he, and he pings balls, and he set pieces with fun. Today, he'd be a multi, multi, multi millionaire. He's got a million free kicks. Yeah, better than what well, you know is David Beckham's, or Jane Wall's prowess. Yeah, but he was doing that with a fucking different ball, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. totally different. Uh, yeah, ball, could do it. it. They played Ipswich once, right? And him and Peter Reid were stood there. I got a free kick, heads of the box against Ipswich, and, and Reid says, "Right, what we can do? We went, we're not going to do fuck all. You can fuck off." <laughs> Ping, right, top corner. Referee, no, no, took it too early. So Reedy's come across. What we're going to do? He said, "I got a pen in the other corner." Ping, fucking goal. <laughs> Right. Talent, yeah, skill, yeah. yeah, and the corners and the quality he had, nobody else could have. So yeah, for me, he was just—he's by far the best one, I think, and the most underrated. Rushy was fantastic to play with because basically with Wales, he went away, defended like mad. Ballyon kicks their best player, and he gets one chance and scores. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was basically our, our plan. You know, and if Barry got booked, we had, we had Sparky midfield who kick him as well. <laughs> Until yeah. he got booked, <laughs> and then we'd be struggling. So, but hopefully by then he, he wouldn't be playing anyway. There was quite a few world class players during your time period with Wales. You probably had uh, say Mark Hughes. Would you say he's world Sparky, class? Yeah, Sparky, yeah, Sparky proved it over time. Rush, yeah. he proved it over time. Rush, yeah, yeah. Rush, hundred percent world class. Uh, his goal scoring record yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So, the stand off us. When, yeah, but also, you know when you know when somebody's <laughs> class is when you have lads coming from the second division, right, and he's playing for Liverpool, top, top of his game, scoring fucking squillions of goals. Yeah. And it, they just click. Not as footballers, just as teammates. And that's hard to do. Because they're coming in with a like, oh, fucking, it's Ian Rush. Mm. But he's like, oh, no, we're, we're like this. And this is how we're all here. So f- off the pitch, fantastic. Because he never made them feel inferior to anything. Mm-hmm. On the pitch, yep, yeah, same. And you think how hard, right, it is to go, say, Alan, I'll tell you a story, Alan Nil, right? Alan Nil, we put playing Holland away. He's been brought into the squad, first time ever, Mark Van Basten. So, fair play to him, he's marked about the game. Right? Ruth Hullett scored, he hit the crossbar with a free kick, and he's got a rebound because our manager put fucking Dave Phillips in the wall and marking Ruth Hullett. Right? So he went in the ball and fucking Rudolph is free. So yeah. he did the ball and gets crossbar. Bom- goal. Never heard of him again. Never seen him again. Right, and he's Mark Van Basten at the game. And I, saw, I didn't see him until Sheffield United got promoted. I see him in a, when I went to watch him and I said, where the fuck have you been? He went, nobody ever contacted me ever. <laughs> no way. Oh, and you think, he's jumped from League Two, right? Not up to fucking League One. Yeah. He's had to jump a, another one up to that. So we jumped four levels. Well, world class player in, in three days. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. three days, how would you do that? So when you look at that, you're going, "I take some doing." Yeah. Plus, he's never played in an international. Plus, he's marking one of the best players in the world. And you're going, "How the fuck has he done that?" Mentally, incredibly strong. Mm. So the ones that come up from the lower leagues, you you realise how how strong and adaptable they are, and you're thinking, "Well, it's easy to play here, isn't it?" 
because you're playing there every week. Yeah. So, so you, you should get a real good golf pro or whatever pro you want to be. And then some amateurs walked along and got oh fucking hell, have a go at that. You know, and the way they the way they do it, they never get any credit for it. Mm. You know, Northern Ireland and, and I've done been the same. They all bring people in from lower down. You think fucking hell, take some doing. Yeah. But nobody ever, nobody ever gives them any credit for the mental strength that it takes to jump them positions. They all go, yeah, so and so from Berry, so and so from whatever. And then they go, oh, he's playing. Yeah. They always mention where they come from, but they don't see. They don't say how incredibly difficult it is to make that jump. Yeah. You see, you go in that old second division, right? I'll guarantee, or the old fourth division as it was. Manager say to him, when you get the ball, fucking launch it in the channels, right? So come international football. He go, we'll try and play from the back, and he's like, okay. So he's got to get that in his head first. He's got to mark somebody who's probably quicker than him, a lot smarter than him. Yeah. And he's got to somehow work that out. And yet he did it for one night and he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Never again. And you think, so sometimes we look at the people at the top, but we should be looking at them and going, wow, how good is that? But they don't. They go, yeah, well, Rush is good to go. What about him? (laughs) Who was the manager at the time? Oh, uh, Terry Yoloff and Peter Shreves. They were good, to be fair. Do you know what I mean? But he just. Never seen him again because when they had the free kick, somebody who fucking run round the side of the pitch trying to get Dave Phillips out the wall to fucking Mark Mar- Mar- uh, to Mark um, So I'm thinking, so what's going wrong somewhere? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, international football's so different. How many players do you think you were off to, to qualifying for a major tournament? Just like uh, one decent midfield player, one decent midfield player, yeah. And is anyone from your time period that you would, if you could make him Welsh for the day or whatever, and bring him into the squad, who would you like to have come in there and, and kind of help support? I'd like Sooners, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. He would have fitted in because you know, it was physical. Also, yeah. he could pass. Yeah, and he was used to playing with Rushi. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah that's that. true. Rushi yeah. made a load of runs and nobody ever seen it. Because it, obviously you've got to remember that Sparky was playing midfield as well. Because we had to try and fit everybody in. Dean Saunders somebody play, sometimes played right wing. So ever Dave Phillips in uh, Dave Phillips played in every position. Clayton Blackmore played loads of positions. So we had people who could fit in. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons as well, is that we had square pegs in round holes. And when they qualify for Euros, they all had players in their natural positions. It makes it miles easier. Yeah. Really. And the, the qualifying was a little bit easier as well to, to get to there, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is and it isn't. It's an apple... Got bigger, but it was easy because we had Gareth Bale. Yeah. And people go, oh, well, you know, uh, Gareth could have an absolute fucking nightmare for 89 minutes, then break away twice and score two goals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was he world class for you? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think he was probably the best Welsh player I've seen. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. Because he kept delivering. Do you know yeah. what? Sometimes you, you go, oh, I'll tell you what, I watch some players and you go, He's not interested. With him, he always delivered. Yeah. So for me, that's the world class bit. He kept delivering, kept delivering, especially for Wales. And you go, not only that, it's, well, I looked at Ryan, and Ryan Giggs is brilliant, but the quality between Gareth and him, actually crossing, Gareth was better than Ryan. It's the yeah. goals, isn't it? He had goals of the game, maybe more than but Ryan he had, he had everything, because you, I used to say to my missus, oh, well, I was like, look at him. Fucking done fuck all. Mm-hmm. Oh, fucking hell's two goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he and he got met. Uh, unfortunately, we got to the World Cup. He weren't fit. No. Yeah. No, he wasn't. Joe Allen weren't fit. Ramsey wasn't either, no. I think. So we went into the World Cup with with people who were stalwarts for us who who, who couldn't do what they wanted to do. And it must be so soul, soul destroying for somebody to to get to the place he wanted to get to and then not be able to do what they wanted to do. So frustration must be, must be terrible, to be fair. So, uh, due in your day, uh, Nev, uh, who would you say, as an outfield player, uh, as opposition, were world-class? Uh, we had Matt Letizia on the show uh, a couple of months back, and he said you were the toughest goal, uh, a toughest goalkeeper that he came up against. Was he? Um, yeah. Do you um, yeah rate any other outfield players? I never worried with anybody, mate. I never looked at anybody else. Was there anyone that kept 
had a knack for beating you maybe in goal. Kenny Dixon scored loads of goals. Kenny I think R- Rio, um, Les Ferdinand scored a, a couple. Um, but, you know, and Rushy scored lots, but I never tend to worry about anybody at all. I have no control over anybody else. So yeah. never worry about anybody else. I never try not to look at the team sheet. I'd think about if somebody scored a goal past me, how they scored it. And I'd log that in my brain and apart from that, no, because I had to do what I had to do. So I can't control them, can I? Unless we're in a one-on-one or whatever, I don't want to control them. But in the main, just do what you've got to do. Prepare what you've got to do. And then, otherwise, I keep saying, if we played Brazil, would I worry about fucking all ten of them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I forget whoever's playing, whatever. You, you, you know certain clubs play certain ways. So my game was based on intimidation. So I try and take positions up where... I tried to get them to do stuff without doing anything. So if they had a corner and, and I thought, well, I've cocked his signal, it's near post. If I went and stood on the near post or something like that, I waved to the fellow on the corner flag. He's now got a choice in his head, doesn't he? Does he put it in there, knowing I'm stood there, or does he do something else? And then as he's got his head down to take it, I just move back. And then if he dropped it short, he go, what the fuck are you doing? And then so intimidate, you can intimidate people doing with just positional play. Mm-hmm. At times, so you don't have to do much, but as long as you're visible, sometimes and you have to put a doubt in their mind. Well, I, could, I could do that doing that, so yeah, for me, it was just about trying to get people to do what I wanted to do. And, uh, with the clever ones, it's great because it's like a real chess match, yeah. Like Burkamp and, and writing and people like that, really good because you think actually you've got to be right on top of your game here because you know what they're thinking and they know what I'm thinking, so it's a game of cat and mouse. Or chicken at times. So I remember Burkham coming along. We played Arsenal down at Ivory and he, he was coming along and he was, he was getting closer and closer. And I thought, I ain't fucking moving. I'm not moving. <laughs> There's no way I'm moving. And so I just stood there and stood and stood. And eventually he hit my legs. Right? And I didn't do nothing but stand there. And that's really hard to do at times. But you have to keep saying to yourself, stand, stand, yeah. don't move, don't move, stand, stand. It's his, his decision. His decision. He's got he's to make his decision. I'm not making it for him. And if you put that on them, it's hard for them sometimes. The thick ones just smash it. And you know the ones that smash it, if you get a touch, you've got a chance of saving it. Mm. The ones that try and place it and do something else, is, they're harder. Because they're thinkers, some of them are not. Because you yeah. get a touch, boom, it's gone. It's gone yeah. away. Because they go for power. So, yeah. It's a lot easier. So, yeah. what? obviously we're on to goalkeepers now. And a clip that, uh, probably at the time didn't realise would go viral was um, there was a, a session with yourself Michael Owen and a 13 year old uh, goalkeeper um, which seemed pretty uh, you know, Michael Owen was taking shots at the goalkeeper but um, it seemed yeah, to go a little bit I think he took it a little bit too seriously maybe from your your reaction well, anyway I least. think he was being ironic to be fair yep. but I think he was enjoying himself and then he, <laughs> and then he was being ironic <laughs> but the poor kid, <laughs> he, 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 he scored a squillion goals past him. He thinks, fucking come on, give, just give him a break, man. Give him a break. But oh, on the day, Mike was okay. He's always okay, to be fair. So, yeah, yeah. people just take it as, as, as a different thing because it's well, clipped it came and cropped. Eh? Okay. It's clipped and cropped. It was a great to comment, to be fair. Yeah, it was, but, uh, yeah you, you hit the nail on the head, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's it, it? Fucking well done, he's 13. You know, in my, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I. Uh, it's How old was Owen at that time? Eh? He was about 18, was, was he? 18? Yeah, something like that. He was okay. So, yeah. so you know. He's only a young lad. Himself. People yeah. judge him on, on that. And it, it, that's not him, really. Yeah, no, yeah. that's fair. The kid, yeah. the kid, I, we did the thing that we fantasy football not so long ago. We met up with that fella. So we're trying to reenact it. So it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> was that one of the chess pieces? No, I don't No, 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 we did it in. I don't know. It was fucking freezing. And he, <laughs> he did the save or something. I don't know. I can't remember. But it was all right. No. But. For him, he, don't, he never went on to play at any level, really. But for him, everybody knows who he is because of that. Yeah. Which is quite nice point, for him, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 100%. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 it's yeah. good for me. Good for him, anyway. Yeah. Well, Any time, I suppose, an Everton player as I go to Liverpool play, that's seen better for the Blues, isn't it? Well, I'm going to ask, um, yeah, what's your proudest moment as an Everton player? Is there any individual uh, trophy or personal award? No, personal awards you never get unless you're part of a good team or a shit team. 
<laughs> because you're really busy. But um, personal awards, are nothing really. So I think winning the league the first time because over whatever number of games it was, we played forty two or so. It proves you're the best. Yeah. And yeah. when you when you finish that, then you know you're the best team in the league. That's really satisfying to be fair. So for me, it, it's sat in the Bayern Munich Cup when it's Cup semi final because we struggled over there. Let me come back and when it go down and I think any other ground, any other city we'd have lost that. Yeah. But we were fortunate to have the people we had there. And I think sometimes you get games with it the team becomes what the city is and everybody comes together. And it's, it's very rare. Very, very rare. And that was that was a night that Everybody came together to to do the same thing. It's a twelfth man sort of thing, get you over the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we had to reflect what the city was. Mm-hmm. And also, it's a hard city. They don't they don't fucking take frauds very well. They see through people. So if you can play at Everton or, or Liverpool, then and people like you, that's because you first of all you put a shift in. Second of all, you're half decent, and that's what they like. If you did better than half decent, they fucking love you. Yeah. You no, know, if if you if you're not very good and you try your bollocks off, they like you, and they'll always stick up for you. But in, in the main, it's a hard city, but with with a lot of passion, a lot of humour, and a lot of class. And I think we showed all of that that night to get back to where we, we should have been. But yeah, you went on to win the cup, and I think you only conceded one goal through that whole cup run. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But again. That's what happens when you get good players. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So when you talk about individual things, it's just nothing, is it? What would I got without them? Yeah. You want to win, yeah, don't you? I think work. teamwork makes the dream work. But yeah. People keep saying there's no I in team, but I fucking found Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously spent practically most of your career at Everton, didn't you? Um, was there any times where you... You, know, you could have moved on, any transfer sort of... Well, I know I was at Man United and Liverpool, but interested. <sighs> Do you know the worst one I had? Was I was off ill. And it's a, a, a paper put in that I had gone to speak to a German club. So I wasn't happy, so I went to the, I went to the manager and said, oh, this is fucking wrong. So he said, oh, so we, we, <laughs> we sued him, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we sued the papers, Murdoch, one of Murdoch's papers, and we stood at the steps of the court, and they thought they were going to settle out of court. So we went in, didn't settle. Apparently said, no, fuck him, we're not, we're not doing that. So we went in, right, and I thought, we sat down, the judge come out, blah, blah, and the old Bailey. And every time somebody said something, he just went like that. I looked at the clock, and basically he said to me, they lied, but they were nice lies. So, no case. Well, the same paper then came and offered me a lot of money to slaughter the manager a couple of weeks later. <laughs> well, that's the game, I guess. Yeah. What you think? Come yeah. On. So, uh, it's, uh, it was a good club. And sometimes if you if you feel at home, basically I could do what I wanted to do. Yeah. With, with, with sometimes, I suppose people like me, I can do whatever I want to do. And Gaz has found this, I suppose, in people like that. Is that while you're giving milk as a cow, yeah. everything's fine. As soon as you don't, they fucking top you, don't they? And that's the way life is. Mm. But as long as you understand that, and you go, I'll tell you what, as soon as I'm used to this club, they're going to get rid of me. Whether I've spent 20 years here or 10 years here or two days, they will get rid of you. That's fine. I didn't mind that because it was for the good of the club that they were doing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If somebody came in and went, well, I don't like you, Okay, but that, I'm going to get rid of you because I don't like you. And that's different. But if you come in here, they think you're not doing well enough. And you get rid of you, you, you can't have any more ups, can you? Yeah. Just Because they're doing it for what they believe is the right of the club. So I don't mind that. You know, we've got to be ruthless. And I wish they'd been a bit ruthless in the recruitment in the last 10 years, or 20 years, to be fair. And they're ruthless in their ambition. But yeah. they haven't. Yeah, with, with the transfers uh, with yourself, was there an incident where... Apparently you went out onto the pitch before. I think we played Leeds at home. I think we were on a 2 or 3 nil down. And I went in the change rooms and it was all kicking off. I thought, I just got to clear my head to one and by the post. That's that famous half time, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then I got suspended for two weeks and two weeks wages. And I managed to play on the Tuesday. 
<laughs> so, but I don't know before the Wimbledon, uh, the old plow lane, because it was fucking boiling hot, and they put about four billion sugars in your tea, and they turned the heating up, don't they? <laughs> but half time, I thought it was fucking boiling. So when I sat on the pitch, and nobody said a word. To be right, fair, there wasn't that many people there. I've only ever found one person who said, who knew about that. So it just shows how big a crowd that was. But yeah, yeah. yeah. so sometimes you got to do what you believe is right, haven't you? No, I wasn't doing it because of anything else, but I just thought I wanted to do better. Did better second half, to be fair. I think we lost in the end 3 2. But because I'd asked them for a transfer, because they, they just wouldn't give me a contract, what I wanted, or anything like that. Well, okay. They, they all took it as a protest, but it wasn't a protest. Yeah. Well, funny enough, the fellow who came on, the fellow came on the pitch, and as he walked across, go, I can't know him. And there's a fellow who tiled my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and as he's getting closer, I'm thinking, fuck, have I paid him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he was all right. He just went, oh, fucking all the best, lad. Fucking come on. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? So but it went really quiet, but yeah. Well, I think sometimes you, you've got to do what you've got to do, and if you're wrong, you're wrong, aren't you? Yeah. But do it because it was for the best of what I was trying to do. Okay. Was it yeah. close to Liverpool, Main Aid? You said the two clubs yeah. interested? Nothing no, at all, went, no comms. I would came back. I said, right, you're not moving. I went, I haven't asked to move anywhere. <laughs> said, yeah, you're not moving. I went, oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. I signed long contracts, so to be fair. I signed a, I signed a six year contract, I think. Because okay. I was quite happy where I was. I didn't, I wasn't, didn't intend to go anywhere. So I was quite happy where I was. When you did finally leave Everton, um, I know you played for Real. Was you ever tempted to join any of the Welsh clubs like Cardiff City, Swansea, or Wrexham? <sighs> Wrexham would be interesting because when I was small, I went for a trial at Wrexham. They said, uh, You're too small, you're too scruffy. <laughs> I thought, What the fuck's scruffy got to be? I was going to say, oh, what the, what's, <laughs> what's that got to do with looking for, like somebody in a three piece suit who could fucking play in goal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so As I went to loads of trials as a kid. I, I went to Bolton for a trial. We played a team of Scousers, we got smashed, but they said they wanted me back, but it was just too far to go. I went to do a trial at Crew. Larry Gregg was manager. And there were some kids watching on the side. So, second half, I fucking played centre half. We played with them kids against the other team. <laughs> so I thought, he's obviously been impressed with me in the first half, or he fucking thinks I'm shit. But I, I'm, I never found out, really. So, yeah. yeah, so I was happy that I worked before I went to football. Right, okay. Really happy. Because yeah. I look at it and I think, you know, I knew what hard work was. It was on the buildings. Yeah. Done all sorts of jobs. I knew what hard work was. I knew that people expected you to be to give everything every week because that's what you do in your job. So for me, it was it was easy. I'm training for a couple of hours a day. Fucking happy days, man. <laughs> you don't want to get up at fucking four o'clock and let me some fuckers bins, do you? That's true. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, that's Good grounding, yeah. Yeah, for me, it was, yeah. you know, well, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, if you've got somebody who's six who joins an academy and they let him go at 10, 12, he's had six years at the club, and you're thinking, yeah, shit for that kid. But what about the parents? Yep. They've seen their fucking dream of a new house, new car, nice holidays, nice way of life, gone. How much does that spoil the relationship between the kid and the parents? You'd hope not, but we don't manage parents' expectations very well, lower down in the, in the academy stuff, and uh, so on the grassroots. So I always wonder whether, at the top, most players can afford to have mental health. They can afford to get somebody in if they struggle, if they don't want to tell a club. The club I've always got, but lower down, down the bottom, is where, imagine having your dream smashed at 10. How do you recover from that? Yeah. yeah. Dream, dream smashed at 16, when you've been there most of your life. You're thinking, it's a big crash, isn't it? So what I'd like to see him do is go, I'll tell you what, we've when you sign, we've got a ladder. So you go, Everton, Tramia, boom, boom, boom. And then we'll send you to the next club, we'll send you down, we'll send you there, we'll send you there. So we look after you all the way down, right down to non-league. And find a level, and I think that's a better way of doing it. Yeah, you could even do that in res- reverse, can you? Really, you, you yeah. know, if they got a promising young player, you can trade him a few. Say, uh, you know, he's yeah. probably not going to make Premier League, but he'll be a decent league yeah, player. You can do that. I mean, the Evans on the tweet at twenty threes were just like cows, weren't they? Because they were there to sell, to keep the thing afloat. Yeah. So really, and it's under twenty threes is complete shite. Well, there's nothing on it. Well, you do see a lot. Um, I think uh, Jay Spearin was playing for Liverpool under 23s. Oh, yeah, and, uh, who's the other one? Tom, uh, Tom Huddleston? Yeah. Yeah. You're thinking, come on. Yeah, you know, I can't, mm. Because he's got the experience and all that, it's great. 
so we can pass it on to the kids and it's, it's nice to have them on a pitch. But the under-23s mean what? You know, I, I looked at Everton and they go, yeah, we won the under-23s. Fucking great. <laughs> so I'm really produced for the first team. That's the real test, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How many make yeah. you're looking at the difference now. 22-23, if you're good enough, you're probably going to be in the first team. <laughs> anyway. We're not around the first team by 17. Hmm. Been them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's as ruthless as that, isn't it? But if you want to win football games at the top clubs, that's the way you've well, got to do it. You're wasting the kids' time. Or you could be playing somewhere else. Yeah. And that's, that's for me, it's... Got to be playing in reserve 17, 18. Got to be. And you've yeah. got to have the talent then to be knocking on the door. If you haven't, no. Because what would you do in your business? Would you keep people on your business who are holding your business back? No, it's just very ruth- ruthless, isn't it? Morally, it might yeah. be the right thing to do, but as a business, you go, nah, cut, 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 cut. Because we only want the best of the best of the best of the best. Yeah, yeah it's shit, but you, you can do it a nice way. If there is a nice way, you've got to find the right way because you want that lad to go away or that girl these days to think highly of the club, to think highly of, of how you've been treated, and so they've always got a tie to your club. Because yeah. if they do go away, somebody can prove they've not left it on the sour note, you've looked after the family, you've done everything you can. If he goes and, and not become a footballer and he becomes a businessman, he can go to him for sponsorship, yeah, and he's a supporter, so you, you don't lose anybody. By being a twat, you just make sure you look after each and every one of them, but you have to be ruthless at the same time. But you yeah. can be. Do you know what I mean? You just got to say, well, look, fellas, here's your ladder. This is when you sign, sit down with the parents, well, here's a ladder. We hope he stays here, but he might drop, drop. It's up to him and it's up to us. To, we'll coach him as best we can. You have the expectation that he's going to finish it there. So we'll look after him educationally as well as football-wise. So we yeah. look after you properly. It's not like they're short a few bob that they can't do it, is it? The Premier League club, so you know. No, I tried to speak to Roberto Martinez about stuff, and he was like, oh, "We can't have that. We can't afford that." Of course, you can. Yeah, because that's where it's needed, and that's where I think the Premier League miss out on making sure the clubs look at the parents. Mm-hmm. And because some of them, I put every penny they've got into that kid. Yeah, every penny, same investment. investment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, same investment, and all of a sudden, I'm right on there thinking, "What are you going to do now?" That's also part of the problem, though, as well, isn't it? If you're treating your child like an investment, you do have to invest a lot of time into it. The, the children at the end of the day you should be just going out enjoying the game, and then if they make a pro, great. But if not, you know, um, well, you know what? Six years old was his childhood. Exactly. Yeah, you know, was his childhood. Is that too young? Yeah. yeah. There's a couple of clubs they've got. So if they don't take him, somebody else will. So they take him. Yeah. Yeah. And they try and build him up. And you're thinking, I wonder at some stage whether they regret that or they have mental health problems because they've not had a proper childhood. Yeah. You know, the pressure they put under at six to keep in there and the fact you've got the family pressure because it's their future. It's not a lot of pressure for a six-year-old, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and what? No point. No, whatever. Make it. I guess. Well, what is it? Wanting so many or whatever. I don't know. Why not? Let, why not just let them play football? Yeah. yeah. Have fun. But they want the robots. They want. They want fucking robots. People aren't robots. People are human. So, is that because the whole recruitment of and scouting of young talent is you know back back in your area? You would go to a grassroots club and look at a player. Rather than having to, I suppose, now take all these players to these academies and try and... Well, basically, there's big trawlers, aren't they? Yeah. The big trawlers, you throw the nets out, see what they can get. Do they give a fuck if some of them are small fish and they throw them back? Not really. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. the way, it's the way you can look after people. You know, I, I had... Some of the dads used to phone me up in the old days and go, oh, we've just been released by Tex. <laughs> Fucking Tex. How can you be released by Tex? Yeah. How bad is that? There's a way to treat people, isn't there? You know, you can uh, oh, let them down gently. I just, I'm worried like mad about what what damage we're doing to some of the younger ones. Because yeah. it's, it's not right. It's not right. It can't be right, can it? Because at some stage, you've got to have that, you've got to have that fun and you've got to have that stupidity when you were a kid. When did you get that then? 
maybe you get them, when you get your money, you go, oh, fuck it, it's that. No. I'm looking for excitement because I don't have any. I've been under that much pressure. Now I've got some money. Fucking hell, where's that car? Where's that drugs? Where's that fucking money? Let's have a gamble, blah, blah, blah. So they might, you know, not saying they do, but that'll be something that I'd be worried about. At some stage, do they need to have a blowout to release that pressure somewhere? Yeah. Mm. And it might not be when they're six or 12 or 16. It might be when they get the first contract and go, yeah, all that hard work. Oh, I've made it. Yeah, a few players like that have gone that way in the past, haven't they? Especially nineties. Yeah, you know, but um, I think it's different. I think now, especially with the money, you get to a point where you sign your first contract, and all that pressure's been building up to that one point. You know, you got the pressure from your family, no matter what they say, they know they can look after their family. Got the pressure from the club, got your pressure from an agent, sponsors, and all of a sudden you've got that first one. You're thinking. Where does that go? It's got to come out with you somewhere. Yeah. And, and nobody ever takes account of, you think, great, he's got his contract. Yeah, well, fucking hell. Is there anything going to come of this? How yeah. can we just make sure that he has his phone? And, and it's hard. It, it, it's really hard, but nobody looks at that side, do they? They all look at the top and go, oh, it's really bad. He's, you know, he's got mental health problems. Yeah, it's really bad. But maybe that's a fucking throwback to when he was yeah. being brought up as a kid. You don't, you don't know, dear. So, they need to do some studies. Be interesting to see how the girls do it when the girls' academy start coming and stuff like that. And, and if they're any different, yeah, that's what I mean. Definitely uh, much later than the boys. You know, you well, yeah. But if you, what was the, the, the girls got different things? Haven't they atomically they they built differently. And then if you look at, I think the first recorded menopause, or the earliest was twelve, I think. So and you can get so. They've got all that other stuff going on. It's 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 just slightly different. I still don't think they've done enough. I don't think they've done enough work with the ball in their chest. Enough research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, same as the boxing. Yeah. You know how many blows can you take there before you do any damage? It's it's the kind of thing that the sport isn't going to want to look at NFL. Well, they will do in 10 years' time, 20 years' time when somebody comes and says, yeah, because the ball hit me on the chest so many times. Yeah. You know, I don't know, maybe somebody else done research, but they should start some research because you look at the rugby and the, and the, football, the old footballers with the balls on their head and stuff like that. It's just... Yeah, a lot of the rugby players... Yeah, it's always the, uh, uh, as an afterthought, isn't it? It's uh, too late. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but, you know, when you look at... Yeah, the breast cancer in the world and stuff like that, you, you want to take no risk whatsoever. So is there any link? So I mean, because they might end up doing something different, might they? They might end up with a different type of bra, they might end up with something else. Well, the, the boots will have to change, won't they? Because the hips are, are made for babies, and men's aren't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the boots, the equipment, and stuff like that, is, it's all different, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So... And then when you come back after having a baby, your hormones take time to settle down. Are people going to actually go, oh, she just had a baby, fucking leave her alone. They're going to go, no, she's shit, get her off. So I mean, so there's going to be other stuff looked at with women, I think, you know, the, the stuff that nobody ever talks about, you know, the hormones and stuff like that. Not because, of, you know, yeah. because of if the body's trying to get back into sync and they're trying to play major sport, it's difficult. So with with player well-being needs to be looked at. I, th I think so, yeah. I, th I think massively. You know, they, they, they're jumping ahead at the moment and they're all pushing and whatever. And Yeah, I think uh, the clubs have suddenly realised, hang on a minute, we can use our ground an extra X amount of times a season if we put the women's um, yeah. people in, in, in yeah, into so, the stadiums. You've got, to, you've got to have the rest of the backup. Oh, I, don't, I don't know whether they have a proper medical every year, whether they do any checks, you know, like uh, screening or whatever like that. I don't know. So. What about the um, the women's goalkeepers? Do you think maybe there should be any adjustments to the size of the goals or something like that? No. Just keep it exactly the same? The goalies will get better. The, the ones I've seen, there's a, there's a difference between the ones that can move and the ones that can't. Yeah. yeah. I know if, I, if I was doing any goalies now, and I would just work on their movement. Foot speed and positioning. Speed, just speed, yeah, and, and sp speed and spring. Yeah. Speed and spring, that's it, because... Technically, they're not too bad, to be fair. They're all right. Mm -hmm. Kick and wise, they, they do okay. It's just... But it'll take a while. It'll yeah. It'll take a while for them to 
get into that position. It's unfair to compare to the men's game. It's a hundred years already down the line, isn't it? So people who compare the two are just stupid people. Yeah, two totally different games. It's in it's yeah. in its infancy. It needs to have time to grow, like the men's men, game did. I'd be interested in the mentality of the women to the men. I'm sure some of them are far stronger than the men. Mm. Yeah, you know I mean? I'd handle more pressure and do more things. For, for me, they I like watching the women because they're still at that naive stage, aren't they, where they're, they're quite innocent and not. I like the no diving, to be honest. I mean, watch well, it's coming in now, slowly. Whereas ladies, yeah. and it's, it's a yeah. much better game to watch, to be it honest. It is. And everything's got to grow. Thank you for watching episode one. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you know when episode two drops with Never Southall. Have a world-class weekend.